um, Hebrews chapter 11. We're going to begin there. Hebrews chapter 11. We're, we've been talking about prayer and what prayer is and, and how powerful prayer is and uh, how God uses prayer and, and how prayer is, is, is such a vital part of us as a believer. You know, we have to be, uh, we have to pray. Um, all Christians pray. Amen? All Christians pray. We have, to, we have to pray. Prayer is not even an option for us as believers. Now, I know that we try to, we, we many times make it optional, but it is an optional as a believer. And so I pray that God would help us tonight uh, and, and see that, that, you know, how important prayer really is. But we've been talking about prayer and how even, even now as we look around and, you know, the, the one thing that always, um, I guess, strengthens me and, and always keeps my hopes up is the Word of God. Amen? The Word of God. God says that the glory of the latter house shall be greater than that of the former house. And no matter how dark and how dreary it looks at the time, God said that the glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former house. And so therefore, I believe that there is going to be a powerful move of God. Now, in knowing that, we still know that there is a process through that to get to that place. And, and we are in the process. I believe it's a testing. I believe that this is a time of shaking because the things that can be shaken will be shaken. So that as the Bible says, that, that the things that cannot be shaken will remain. And, and you know, we're going to see a, a lot of, uh, of things happening. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of things happening. Anyone with any kind of spiritual uh, sense understands and can see through the false and can see that, that, you know, it's not just about uh, emotionalism. Um, we can get emotional over a lot of things. As we've said, oftentimes, I can watch a commercial and get emotional over it. Doesn't mean God was anywhere in the, in the vicinity, but, but I, I got emotional. Um, I can get emotional uh, just at a lot of things, watching a TV show, anything. You can get, it doesn't, God doesn't have to be anywhere near it. And, and, but, but many Christians can look at that and say, oh, well, that was, that was God. No, that wasn't God. That was you and I getting emotional. There was a chemical change, and all of a sudden we, we, we felt something, and then it was emotionalism. You know, the, and, and that's where we have to have discernment. That's where, and, and, and discernment only comes through prayer. The power, the gifts only come through prayer. See, God has offered all of the things in his word. As he said to us, he's given us all these things, but he will be inquired by, by, about these things. All of them are yes and amen, but you and I are not going to get one of them unless we pray for those things. And that's just the way that he's made it, that, that we must pray for the things that he desires and has for us. And, and that's why we have to have discernment because... We can go into a, a lot of places and, and we can, we can and, and I've said this many times, we can hear talent, we can hear the gifting of somebody and get emotional over those kind of things, but God never be anywhere around it. And just because they're singing some kind of a, a, a spiritual song doesn't mean the presence of God was there. You know, there's a lot of good talent. There's a lot of good things out there, but it doesn't mean God's presence is there. And you see, we have to be very, very careful and ask God for discernment. But see, all of this, God says, I will be inquired of about. So the church as a whole is, is in a waste place spiritually. It's, it's in a place of desolation. And, and here's the thing. The world knows it. The church is the one that's blind to it. See, the church has gone about, and, and, and anyone who, and, and let me put it this way, anyone who has tasted of what is real knows and can tell the difference between what is real and what is false. Anyone who, who, who has experienced 
the power and the presence of God can honestly tell the difference whether God is there or not, whether it's his presence or it's just me being emotional. Now, uh, admitting it is a whole other thing. You see, I can go and I can hear somebody speak the word of God and, it, and, and they, might, they might have tr- trouble even putting a couple of phrases together. But I can tell you this, if they prayed over it and they're, and they're doing it and, and God's presence is there, you're going to feel his presence. Whereas other people can sit there and with their silver tongue put all these things together. And if God's presence isn't there, it was a good presentation, but that's about all it was. And we need to, be, we need to pray that God gives us discernment. Again, I'll say it. That God isn't going to give it to us until we be, he be inquired of it. That's what he tells us in, in, in verse 37 of Ezekiel 36. That, that the, the Lord says, I will yet be inquired of by the house of Israel to do these things for them. And, and, and you know, God wants to be asked. Why don't we give our... A lot of times we... We wait for our kids to ask us. I've been waiting for you to come. I've been waiting for you to ask me. And, and you know, I, I mean, yes, but you've had it all along. Yes, I've had it all along. But you're going to come and ask me. You can't expect everything just to be, just to, you know, me to read your mind or, or whatever it may be. Because we, we can actually condition our kids in a wrong way by just, by just giving them things before they ask for them. It's good to ask. And God's going to teach us how to ask. See, we cannot do God's will without his help. But he will not do his will without us. His will will be done. And there will be someone who will stand in the gap and make up the the difference. He will find somebody that will want to do his will. He's going to find somebody that will pray. He will find somebody that will seek him. And when that person does, he will answer. And that's the bottom line. You see, we we think, oh, well, well, I'm something special. You're nothing special. I, I mean, I don't mean to be mean. I'm nothing special. If, if that's the case, then we're all special in God's eyes. But God will still be inquired by you or me. God doesn't give one special privilege over the other. You know, in, in my house, I don't have favorites. And we shouldn't have favorites. And there shouldn't be this favoritism. But I can tell you this. We do have intimates. The person, the, the, the one child, you, you don't ask for it, but they come to you and they keep coming to you and they keep coming to you. And it's kind of like the older, the, the, when you look at the prodigal son, the older son and the younger son, the older son gets all upset when the younger son comes home and the father slays the fatted calf and the whole thing and, and everything. And the younger son, he realizes his his, the error of his way. So therefore, out of gratitude, when he sees the father, he loves the father. The father doesn't even have to ask him to do things. He just does them. You get this sense of the, the younger son is so grateful that he's just there. And what, what do you need now, father? What, do, what can I help you with, dad? What? And so he realizes the older son, where's he at? And he goes out and he says, what's wrong, son? He says, well, you never slayed the fatted calf. He says, you've been in my house all this time. You never asked. It was always yours to slay. You could have done it any time. I wasn't going to argue with you. See, I don't believe that it was the fact that he slayed the the, the, the fatted calf for the younger son. I think that the the older son just got, got jealous because he didn't do it for him. He could have had a barbecue, invited all his friends over, and dad wouldn't have said anything about it. It was his all along. And you see, when, when, when we see that they're, and, and as a parent, we see our children have different needs. It's not that we love one more than the other, but sometimes one is more needful than the other. And that's just, that's just the honest truth. But it's the one that keeps coming to you that gets most of the attention, whereas when they keep coming to you and getting most of the attention, then the others start saying, well, well there's your favorite. It's not that they're your favorite. 
Why haven't you been coming? I've reached out to you, but you don't, why? I've never needed it. Well, that's why you feel the way that you do. And you see, many times we see God moving in the lives of someone else, and then we get all, well, well I can't believe. Well, well, why would God do it for them? Have you been intimate with God? Have you been spending time with God? You see, we get all upset because, because now God is moving in somebody else's life. But they've understood a principle. And they figured something out that you, you knew, but you just don't practice. And so that person keeps going to God and asking God and keeps, keeps, stays in the foot, at the presence of God, just like Martha and Mary. I think the Bible is replete with these kind of examples. Martha is, is busy, busy, busy doing the work of God, going here, going there. She never takes the time. She thinks that if I go here and go there, and then, then, I'm, and, and then she sees Mary. She gets all upset and jealous, just like the, the older son of the prodigal. She gets all upset. Why? Because Mary has chosen the intimate part. I'm just going to go, and I'm going to spend some time with Jesus, because Jesus doesn't need me running around all the time. He doesn't need me doing all of these things. He needs me there in his presence. Now, there will be a time to work, but I can tell you this, that time when I get ready to work will be so joyous rather than a laborsome thing. It'll, it'll be a time of joy and appreciation, and then, and then it'll be, Father, what do you need me to do next? Why? Because now I'm doing it out of a grateful heart because there's an intimacy factor that has taken place. Why? Because God said, I'll be inquired of these. Because God doesn't want to be a God afar off. He said, I'm a God that's near. I'm a God that's close to your heart. I'm a God that's close to your problems. I'm a God that is close to your situation. And I'm only as close as you want me to be. It's up to you and me. He says, but yet I'll be inquired. Why? Because he wants the intimacy. The one thing that we refuse to give him, the intimacy. And, and I can tell you this, the intimacy, part of it is when you're in a, in a worship service and lifting your hands. But if that's the only time, then that's not in, intimacy. That's emotionalism. That's not intimacy. Intimacy takes place on a one-on-one -on -one. With Jesus Christ, not in a group of people. It's great when you can get in a group of people and share that moment, but it's the one on one that makes everything else so much better. And see, and I believe that that's what the church is missing. The church has become, they begin to think that it's, 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 more about, it's more about the greatness, the bigness, and how many people, and, and if we can get a crowd, and, you know, and all of us can get emotional. But none of us spend time, quality time in his presence. And I, and I will say this again, in saying all these things, that it's not the quantity, but it's the quality of the time. And I think I said that on Sunday. It's not the quantity, but it's the quality of the prayer time and the time that you have with God. And, I'll, and, and let me put it like this. A lot of people say, well, well I spend time with my children yeah, you might, spend, you, you might spend a lot of time in the same room. But if, but if you're sitting there watching TV, reading the newspaper, and you say, well, I, I'm home every night. And my children, I, we spend time together and we're there every night. It's not the quantity of time, it's the quality of time. Well, how much time do you spend sitting with your child and talking to them and sharing with them and hearing what they are, what, what's going on in their heart and you sharing what, what you have prayed over them and, and spending quality time? And it may be 15 minutes of quality time to somebody else's, you know, I spend three nights, three, three hours every night, seven days a week we spend. Where's the quality? You see, in the same thing in prayer. You can spend three hours of nothingness in, in what you would call prayer without quality time in prayer. And that's why I say when we get ready to pray, we want to know 
how to pray, how to pray effectively, what to pray, so that when we get into prayer with God, there's an intimate moment, and it's not about the, the, the amount of time, but it's about the quality of time in his presence. And that's what God desires, the quality. See, you can't do the will of God without his help, and he won't do it without us, without somebody without somebody that's willing to spend time in his presence. He just won't do it. No matter how much you try to manipulate the situation, God is not a man that he can be manipulated. He's not like your earthly mother and father that can be manipulated. God sees right to the heart of things. He knows whether you're coming and and trying to butter him up just because you're about to ask him something. He knows better. And so he won't be fooled like that. See, if we believe anything, see, we don't, we don't have an option in what, this, what we call prayer. Prayer is not optional. I know a lot of, I, I, and, I'm not even, and I'm not even making it up. I'm telling you, there was one minister that, that said, you know, who, we don't have time to study. All the study has already been done. I'm sitting here thinking, what do you mean we don't have time to study? Because if you're saying that, then I wonder about your prayer life. Because I can tell you this, my prayer life is enriched by my studying the word. The word. Yes, other books and stuff are good helps, but but the word, nothing is like the word when I can memorize the word and, and recall it in that moment of prayer, when I, can, when I can find myself in intimate worship with God, just me and him, I, I'm telling you, I can recall songs from way back when. And, and, and the moment I start singing them, I, I'm telling you, I know his presence is there. Why? Because they're coming from the heart. They're coming from, from, from a time of study and preparation. They're coming. And, and, and one thing I remember one, uh, my, my old pastor telling me was, never let the opportunity to preach drive you to the word. Get in the word and the opportunity to preach will come. And I, and I can tell you this, never let the, the, let the opportunity to witness to somebody drive you to the word. Get in the word and God will give you an opportunity to witness. Get in the word. Get in the word and prayer. See, prayer isn't an option. God said, I've made all of these promises to you, but, but yet, if you want one of them, you're going to have to ask me for them. It's almost like sometimes we just, we, we don't want to do that because in, on, in, in all honesty, prayer sometimes is the hard work. It's the breaking up of the ground. It's, it's the preparing ourselves. It's the, the getting to the point to where we begin to ask God. You know, though he, even though he made all of these things and all the promises available to us, he said, you're going to have to come to, pray to, to me and ask me for them. All of them are here. All of them are yes and amen to the believer, but you're going to have to ask me for them. You're not just going to come in and think that you're going to just, just oh, you know what? I'm going to declare something. And I've heard that over and over. And I heard people declare a lot of things. It, ain't, it doesn't mean a, a thing. They, they, they try to declare, oh, I declare that, that I'm not going to be sick. I declare that I'm going to. And I'm just sitting here thinking that doesn't mean a lick to God. Because there's no intimacy. They think that they can just command a thing without intimacy. And God has to do it. But God doesn't work that way. God will have to, he says, I will be inquired. The Bible tells us, though, that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Can I tell you this? When I worry, that's, that's a lack of faith. And that's, I'm not saying, I'm going to be honest like Paul. Not that I'm already perfect, meaning not that I've already figured it all out, but I'm pressing on toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I'm pressing on. But I can tell you this. I don't worry about things much anymore. I, I, I honestly don't. I just don't get worried and get all uptight over things. Why? Because he said not to. He said be anxious for nothing. Why, why should I be anxious for it? You know, if I'm asking God for something, I'm, I, all I need to do is get in his word, pray and ask him, and then, and then leave it up to him to answer me. 
Why, why am I going to sit there and say, well, is he going to say yes or no? Is he going to say yes or no? But you ask them. You know, keep asking until you get an answer. But why worry about it? Trust in him. Keep your heart in perfect peace. Keep your mind and your heart in perfect peace. You know, I don't have to be concerned over a lot of different things. I absolutely don't. Is, is the money going to come in? Well, you know what? If I'm doing everything that I need to do, and I've asked about it, whether it comes in or not, it's not going to change anything. Why am I going to get all uptight about it? But I can tell you, people will worry about this and worry about that, and I can't believe, and I'm... And, you know, God's going to tell you yes, no, or wait. And he's going to say the same thing every single time. Yes, no, or wait. Why get worried? See, unbelief shows, uh, I mean, uh, worry shows unbelief. So we have to believe that he is. And, and prayer shows our attitude towards this. As I've said, and, and I will stress this over and over, and, and, and sometimes it is redundant because that's what preaching many times is. It's just redundancy until it finally sets in. It's like a parent who tells his child over and over and over and over again. And it's, it's a funny thing to me because I'll preach the same message over and over and over, the same principles over and over and over. And then all of a sudden, somebody will come to me and say, you know, I heard this pastor say, or I heard brother so-and-so say, and it's just like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's how many times? But see, one sows another waters, God gives the increase. There comes a moment in time where it finally takes and that person comes to a revelation or comes to a place where they can receive that, that word from God. And so I, I don't have a problem saying the, the same thing over and over and over. We have to believe and our, and our attitude towards prayer shows whether we believe God or not. I'll, I'll pray if I believe prayer is effective. I will pray if I believe that prayer is the answer. Now, you can ask a Christian, and most Christians will say, oh, prayer is the answer, right? Most Christians will say, oh, well, I'll be praying for you, but do they really pray? Most Christians will say, yeah, if you have an issue, have you prayed about it? And, and we know that prayer, we, we, in principle, we know that prayer is the answer. But my doing speaks more than my saying. How much time do I spend in prayer? And when I have a pressing issue that's, that, that's taking place in my life, is the first place I go to prayer. You see, I mean, is, is Jesus the first thing that comes to my mind? Rather than going to the internet, rather than calling up your, your, your in-laws or, or your brother or your sister, rather than going somewhere else or, or looking at your bank account. Can we afford that? Can we do this? Can we do that? What, what's, what's the first response? Many times prayer is the last thing we do. Why? Because it shows our attitude towards prayer. It shows our attitude towards God. We don't believe that God can or will answer it fast enough for us. So prayer becomes the final issue rather than the first. And so, so, so it shows our attitude towards God. It shows our, our faith, our lack thereof. When you and I come to a place of prayer, we're showing our attitude and, and saying that we believe that God is who he says he is. In a place of prayer, I demonstrate my absolute total submission and dependence upon God. When I get down to pray, that's what I'm showing. I'm showing my, my absolute, uh, uh, total dependence and submission toward God. God, this has always been under your control. This has always, always been your, your problem, not mine. If I am your child, then this is your issue, not mine. It's, it's not about me, it's about God. So God is going to deal with our attitude towards him, towards his provision, towards uh, against the world, towards every, every circumstance that we're faced, towards grief, towards bitterness, towards hurt, towards everything will be dealt with right there in prayer. It'll be our attitude towards God. So Hebrews chapter 11 and 6, it says that without faith it is impossible to please God. 
Now this, is, this, I believe, most of us could quote. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a what? A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I mean, we could say that. We, we've read it so many times that it's easy to quote. But see, he's going to, he's going to take care of our attitude towards him. The, the thing is, is, is in, God's, in God's school of things, he's going to allow you to keep taking the test until you finally get it. You see, if you're really wanting to, to learn in, in the school of Christ, if you will, if you're really wanting to learn... You will, you will get to take the test over and over and over until it finally sinks in. You see, because here's the thing. God will not shortcut his system. He's not going to say, oh man, this poor, this poor fellow has taken the test a hundred times. Let's just pass him. God's not going to grade on a curb. He's not going to say, well, he got most of them right. Let me just let him move on to the next thing. He's not going to do that. Why? Because he would be shortcutting you and I of spiritual strength. He would be shortcutting you and I, and, and we would not be ready or prepared for the world. He's not like the school system that is out there and in place today. They pass them along just because, just because, you know, we can't have them in our grade, this grade anymore. It looks bad on our statistics. And, so, and, and the money's not going to come in if we don't move them on. And, and so, so they pass kids on through the school system, and they graduate them, and they can't even read. And they're not ready for the real world, but the school system has told them, oh, you're perfectly ready. And they've, they've sent them out there to fail. God's not going to do that. If you're going to be in first grade uh, the rest of your life, you're going to be in first grade until you learn the lessons and then he'll move you on to the next. And, and, and I can tell you this, God knows what you and I have need of, where we're lacking, and, and he's going to make sure and he's going to take care of this issue. So there's nothing that shows more about how I feel about God than my prayer life. And I can tell you this, if you're going to struggle in one area of your life more than any other area, it's going to be prayer. How many people that, I mean, I don't even need to raise their hands, but how many people have served God over any amount of time know that the one area that's the hardest is prayer? We can open up our Bible and we can read. We can do our reading. Okay, got that done. But how many, how many of us honestly know quality time in prayer is our greatest struggle? And then I want to say this. Every issue that you're facing can be taken care of at the altar. Why do you think Satan fights you and I so hard in this area called prayer? Because he knows if you ever learn the key, you will unlock every promise to the word of God. In effectual, fervent prayer. You see, the only way that that can be effectual, effective, the only way that it can be fervent is because you absolutely believe in it. No other way. You absolutely believe that God is. You absolutely believe what he said. You absolutely believe that if he said it, he will do it every single time. You absolutely believe that if I get down in prayer and I take this situation to God in prayer. See, I've read, I've prayed, I, and now I'm going to pray, and God is going to answer. I'm telling you if, you, if you believed, you know that it would be taken care of in prayer. That if you, if you had an issue at work, if you had an issue in your family, something is going on, and you've read about it, and you know what to do, but, but nothing seems to be working, then you know that if I get down in prayer, God will give me the answer. 
You see, if I can get down in prayer and, and pray the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person, then God will give me the answer to that prayer. And I can tell you this, whatever situation it is, at work, in your home, in your family, God will give you the answer. The other side of that is, you might not like the answer. You see, I have to be willing and ready to receive whatever answer it is that God is ready to give me. Because I can tell you this, it might be me. I might be the problem. But see, in prayer, when I come to God and I, and I submit to him in total submission, what I'm saying is, God, search me through and through. I want the answer. I'm tired of this. I need you to help me. And I can tell you this, God will help you. See, my faith is never tested like it's tested when I get down to pray. When I get down to pray, every devil comes and he invades that room to see what's going to happen. I'm telling you, the devil, the, if, if you're not a praying person, the devil isn't afraid when you wake up in the morning. But I can tell you this, he watches and he gives assignment to those devils. And he watches every believer get up in the morning. He watches to see what they do next. Because the moment he watches and sees that believer go to that altar in prayer, whether it's to sit down at that table, maybe, maybe you know, your knees don't work that well and you have to sit down. There ain't, that doesn't matter. You can sit down. But when he sees that, that believer sit down or kneel in prayer and get intimate with God, I'm telling you, that's when he begins to shake and to shudder. You see, the devil is afraid of the praying man and the praying woman. Psalm 106 in verse 7, starting with verse 7. He said, Our fathers understood not the wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even the Red Sea. You see, they did not understand the great deliverance that God had given them. God was looking for a place to, to put his presence, he was looking for a place to birth Christ and to bring the, his people into full maturity. He wanted to, to bring them to a place where they would see his presence and they would see him and glorify him for who he was. See, the Bible says that there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repent, repents than anything else why? Because a new creature is another opportunity for Christ to be put on display in the world. And, I, and, and, and let me put it like this. The new creature is another opportunity for the image of God to be seen. I, I was able to, to preach this, this past week out there in, in San Carlos and, and man, what, a, what an awesome time we had. And, and we were able to see the power of God move and, and the, the last night there was a group of kids, this last night, it was last night, we, uh, I think a group of about five or six kids just came right off the street. We got to pray with them. And, and to see God begin to break the chains and I was speaking about the man of Gadara who, go, who Jesus Christ had cast the, 6,000 demons out of, thousands of demons out of, and, and how, how God broke the chains over his life. And, and you know, we, we, we look at, we count success by numbers. We count success by numbers. Jesus counts success by quality. You see, because of Jesus, if God be for us, who could be against us? And so, so we, we were sitting there, and, and you know, you labor. They that labor, uh, that, that, that sow in tears, will reap in joy. And, and then all of a sudden, we get to see a, a small breakthrough. But, but see, here's the thing. The man of Gadara, he was one man 
who God broke the chains off of his life. He broke the, the, the he, he took and he set the man free. Now the man in the end wanted to go with him. And Jesus said, no, you're not going with me, but you go back into that place. And you go back and you tell them all of the great things that God has done. See, because the Bible says that they knew this man. They didn't know, they didn't know Jesus. They didn't know the preacher. They, didn't, they could care less about the man up there speaking the word of God. But they know those little kids and those young men that were out there on the street that come up and down that street all every day doing their bidding. You see, when they see their lives change for the glory of God, then they will begin to ask God. They don't care about you and me. Good, we get to go out and preach the gospel. Thank God I had the opportunity to do it. But you know what? The miracle wasn't me. The miracle was that young, those young men that got saved. It was those young men that prayed that prayer. Why? Because they're going to see them because they know what life they were. They know where they came from. They know what they were like. It is, it is, it's nothing about you and me. It's all for the glory of God. You see, but unless we have a big event and we got thousands of people out there and hey, That doesn't impress God. One man of Gadara goes back and he preaches. You know, that, that, that where he went to preach, there were 10 cities. And, and I forget all of the cities that were, that were there, but it was right there off the Sea of Galilee. Who was the evangelist for all those places? but the man who was possessed with, with, with thousands of demons that everybody knew and everybody was afraid of, now they see him talking about the love of God, the grace of God, the power of God, and they see God all over him. They see the image of God on him. And the same thing with those young men. Why? Because it wasn't about us. It was about Jesus Christ being glorified. You see, Satan tried to destroy the image of God in that man in, in so many ways. And the reason why Satan hates you, the reason why he hates everyone out there is because when he sees them, it's not about them. And I'll say it again. It's not about them. But because we were created in the image of God, every single human being that Satan looks at, he hates because it reminds him of God. And we think, oh, it's about me. Oh, I'm so righteous. And then, oh, you. It's about Jesus Christ. And see, and so Satan was attacking this man because he was attacking the image of God. But Jesus Christ set him free and turned it all around. You see, the, the, the people of Israel forgot what God had done for them. And I would dare say many Christians have, have forgot what Jesus Christ has done for them, just like the children of Israel forgot how God set them free. Now for us to do anything, they want me to serve in church. Why would they want me to serve in church? My goodness, don't they know that I have this, this, and this, and that? My goodness, well, why, why do they want more out of me? You know what? We don't need anything out of you. But, but I can tell you this. You've forgotten something. You have forgotten what Jesus Christ has done for you. You have forgotten what he saved you from and what he has saved you to. And if you don't remember that, and if you forget for too long, you might end up in the place where you were before. It's good to serve. It's good to get out of your comfort zone. It's good to give above what you think you can give of yourself. I don't have any more time, but I'm going to give it anyway. I don't, I don't have the extra, but I'm going to give anyway. Why? Because of what Jesus Christ has done in my life. You see, when I begin to pray, when I begin to show uh, you know, my gratitude towards God, my faith in God is in that altar. In, in verse 8, of, of 106, it says, nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake. And there you see, it wasn't about them. It was about him. He saved you for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power to be made known. That's why he saved you, so that he could show the devil that he still has the power to save. 
You see, he, he rebuked the Red Sea also, and it was dried up. So he led them through in the depths as, as through the wilderness. Verse 10, and he saved them from the hand of him that hated them and redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. He's talking to you and me. He's talking to you and me. See, this is why Paul says in, in, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, he says, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your reasonable service, meaning it is the least that you and I can do for the glory of God because he redeemed us, he saved us from the enemy. But see, the reason why we stop giving him and offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, is because we forget what he saved us from and what he saved us to. And if we're not careful, we'll end up back in the place where we were. You see, one day it's all going to come out. All you read in the, in, 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 in the word of God are commands. There's not one suggestion in the word of God. Not one suggestion, like many people that preach this grace gospel will tell you, they're all commands. Offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is the least that you can do. For all that he's done for you, Jesus Christ went to a cross and died in your place. He took your sin upon him. He took your sickness upon him. He took, he took even the very, the, very the, 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 the torment and the torture, the things that brought you peace, they were, they were laid upon him. The reason that you're in your right mind tonight is because all of that garbage was laid upon him. And if you forget that, you'll get it back. And the second state of that person will be worse than the first. And he says, it's better to have never known me than to have known me and turned your back on me. Because I can tell you this, it will be much worse for you the second time around. You see, but we, we, get, we get complacent. Verses 11 through 13 read, that, read like this. And the waters covered their enemies. There was not one of them left. They then believed they his words. They sang his praise. And listen to what verse 13 says. They soon forgot his works and waited not for his counsel. Did you, did you get that? I mean, you, you just heard, and the waters covered his enemies, and there was not one of them left. Then believed they his words, and they sang his praise. They soon forgot his works, and they waited not for his counsel. They no longer found prayer to be a necessary thing. Why? Because they got at ease in Zion. God had given them everything that they needed. He had provided every need for them. He did all of it for them, so they stopped praying. You know, that was one of the things that God warned them about when they got ready to go into the, in, into the land of Canaan. He said, be careful when you get ready to go into the land of Canaan. He says, least you fall into comfort and you, you taste of the fruit and you eat of the grapes and you get all the good things and you drink the milk and the honey and you get all of that and you forget about me. Solomon understood this to a great degree. Solomon had become the wealthiest man that I believe had ever walked the face of the earth. Even in today's standards, I don't believe that there was anyone as wealthy as Solomon was. But Solomon, in all of his wisdom, came to a place where he told God, he said, don't give me more than I need that will cause me to stray from you, but don't give me less than I need that would cause me to, to, to stray from you. Give me exactly what I need. I can tell you this. If you have to live a life of misery every day of your life in this life so that, so that in the end you will be with him in glory, it will be worth every moment. I'm telling you, there's, there are actually people like that. That God has to save by fire. 
And I, and, and, and I would, and anyone who would argue that is a hypocrite. You see, don't give me more than I, that, so much that, that I'm going to stray from you. You see, a lot of people pray, oh, God, if God would just give me a million dollars, I'd do this and this. No, and he, and, and he won't give you a million dollars. Why? Because he knows exactly what you'll do when you get that million dollars. But, but, and, and some people, well, well you know, I, you see them dragging, it seems like all their life, they just seem like they're, 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 they're in trouble. Why? Because, because that's what keeps them on their knees. Why? Because they continue to forget what God has done for them. I can tell you this. Don't forget what he's done for you. Continue to pray. Pray always. Make it a part of your life. And don't just make it a routine. Make it intimate. Love God. Serve him. Delight in his presence. Know him. How do you do that? Get in his word. Read his word. Read of all the great things that he is and who he is. And love on him and tell him how much you love him and how grateful you are. And never let your heart become ungrateful. Because the day that you let it become ungrateful, I'm telling you, you'll stop praying. And then you'll begin to forget. And when we stop praying, that means we've already forgotten. And it's no longer a necessity. You see, prayerlessness is a heart of unbelief towards God himself. Prayerlessness is a heart of unbelief toward God himself. I don't believe in you. We don't say it like that. We just don't pray. I don't believe in you. When we're not praying, that's exactly what we're saying. I, 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 I mean, that's, that, that's kind of a hard word, right? But it's absolutely true. Because if, if, if you believed in him and believed that he was all that he said that he is, you wouldn't miss an opportunity to pray to him. And I pray that we would. We, our, our prayer lives would be ignited. I pray that, that, that we, would, we would find a newfound relationship with God in prayer, that there would be this joy of getting into his presence and allowing him, in, in, because in those moments, we begin to take on more of the image of Jesus Christ. We become more like him as we behold him in the spirit and in prayer. When we get into the word and we hear about him and we begin to pray and we rejoice in his presence, then we can come into the house of God and rejoice with all the other believers. And then our rejoicing will be so much more real. It won't be a, a show. It won't be a performance. It will be, man, I, I'm so glad that I'm in, in the house of the Lord with fellow believers that we get to rejoice together and we bring our faith and our love and our joy for, in, for our Savior and we rejoice together and then God sees that and rejoices over us. There's a response on his side to faith and nothing speaks of our faith more than our prayer life. Nothing speaks of our faith more than our prayer life and it will never change and as I said, God is never going to change the system. He will not change it for one person because everyone is the same in his eyes. Everyone. He is no respecter of persons. He created each one in their mother's womb. This is something, this is something that, that, that we'll have to learn. We'll have to learn even in missions, in evangelism, we will have to learn. God is no respecter of persons. We are. Even though we don't like to say we are, many times we are, and we've been conditioned that way. You see, when a, when a missionary or an evangelist goes and speaks to the people, he has to realize, and he better realize, there is no difference between him and that sinner that's sitting on the corner. God loves them both the same. And, and, and here's the thing. It doesn't matter how educated and how fixed up he is and how uneducated that person is out there. God loves them just the same. 
and he's no respecter of persons. When we start thinking, oh, well, I had to come for your sorry soul, you're worse than he is. Just like that, just like that, that, that Pharisee, that publican that prayed, ah, oh, glad I'm not like him. You see, there's no difference. You see, we, we come to a place where we think, and, and in our mentality of ministry, I, I'm telling you, the church has gotten it so wrong on so many levels. We come to a place of mentality when we go to evangelize a place or we go as a missionary to a place. And we think they need me here. No, they just need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you this? Jesus didn't need to stay there with the man of Gadara. After he had received the good news, he was able to go out on his own. He didn't need Jesus standing by him every second of the day telling him what to do. Why? Because he was a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things had passed away. All things had become new. Now he was able to preach the gospel to his own people. He didn't need the missionary there. You see, we get things all messed up. Jesus never did. We can never think that God cannot do it without me. Because I can tell you this, God can do it without this pastor here today. I could walk out of these doors never to enter them again. And, and God, this church will go on. Why? Because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This church isn't built upon me, upon my ministry, upon anything to do with me. This church is built upon the rock of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Never think that we're more important than somebody else. We are all a piece of the puzzle. And if one piece is missing, it's not complete.